Welcome to Spotlight on Surus, brought to you by WCG TV Access Channel 12, right here in Surus, Manitoba. My name is Laura Higgs, and today is March the 20th, 2019. Our guest today is Dr. David Cram. He is here to speak with us today about the um, portable ultrasound machine that is hopefully coming to Surus one day. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Laura. Glad to be here. So, tell me, portable ultrasound machine. It is going to be purchased by? Um, by the donation funds that have been created already. And, and first of all, I'd really like to thank the community for the tremendous work they've done. It's really nice to see a community come together and support the physicians in providing care to our, to our region, which mm -hmm. is really, really important for all of us. And plus, I have to say, there was one donor in particular that uh, contributed a significant amount of money, so we're in a very good position. Nice. Um, as long as the health auxiliary, work, correct? Yes, 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 you betcha. And it's a, what is challenging now is this is an evolving technology, mm -hmm. um, and ultimately it's going to become like the doctor's stethoscope. Um, I don't know if I'll still be practicing then, but in 10, 20, 30 years, doctors are all going to have their own little portable ultrasounds which they're going to have in their hand and scan you when they need to, right. rather than using a stethoscope. But right now it is very much in evolution. And that's one of the challenges because there's no set standards for the province. Um, the province isn't providing any to the hospitals themselves. It's totally up to the health regions to buy on their own like we are by themselves or physicians. So one of the key things we need is, is we need to educate the physicians because quite frankly, I don't know how to use them. Mm -hmm. And so we need to look at taking some courses and we're looking at uh, dealing with some physicians out of the practice program in, in uh, Portage because they actually train students there, uh, looking at piggybacking on one of their courses to, to learn more about this. And then pick a machine and then move forward and, and actually buy one. So it really is a process and evolution, and I thank everybody for the patience because, mm -hmm. you know, a year ago when we started this, if we would have gone ahead then, I, I, things have evolved even farther since then. So we really have to be careful in what we purchase and how we use it. Right. So it's not like a Brandon or Winnipeg where you go for an ultrasound, there's the big machine, the technologist, right. the radiologist that reads a result and yes. sends it on to the, mm -hmm. it, you're using it at more as a diagnostic tool. Exactly. Right? Okay. Um, it, it's, not the, it's not going to replace the ultrasound that you get when you go to the larger centers, which are done by a uh, professional scanner and then that gets read by a radiologist mm -hmm. and those are much more uh, in depth. These are what we, what we would call point of care tools like a stethoscope is, mm -hmm. like a scalpel is, things like that. Right. So that say some of the things we would do is if we're trying to put an in intravenous in and as a nurse you know that it's sometimes difficult so a lot of times we'll, we can use an ultrasound to find that vein to get into that vein properly and that will assist us at what we call point of care at the bedside. Um, other cases we would use it say in the emergency room where say uh, a woman comes in with some bleeding and we're wondering had she lost the baby or not well we can scan to see if there's a pregnancy there or not still right. uh, we wouldn't rate the pregnancy or do all the other detailed scans that they would do in a larger right. center but nevertheless we would do something to help us with care at that point right right it's a wide range of things that we would use it for um, in trauma for instance like car accidents and things when people have had significant trauma to their upper chest you know there's a series of scans that we would do to check for fluid in the chest because you don't want fluid in the chest you want air in there mm -hmm. we can scan the heart to see if there's fluid around the heart um, we can scan for pneumonias um, masses that we might find in the abdomen we can scan to see if they're solid and concerning like a cancer or they fluid filled like an abscess so those are some of the things we would use an ultrasound for right and point of care is very important because then you know where you need to send your patient after that exactly what we need to do it's a diagnostic tool so while mm -hmm. you're caring for the patient that helps you make that diagnosis decide on what you need to do next so it's a huge time saver um, yes, and it just, it's better care, it's expanded care, you know, and, and I think that's the impetus for anything we do now is it's just better patient care, and this is a tool, but interestingly and, and when ironically that there's really not a set of standards and there's really not uh, provincial guidelines on, on how to use them as of yet, so it's a really a, a technology that's in flux but is rapidly progressing. So we have the money for the machine. Certainly, We yes. have a machine in mind, a brand name? Yes, there's two or okay. three that are approved by the province, um, and I think that's probably one of the three we'll be getting, okay. uh, but again... Uh, approved by the province as in as well, good equipment. It's interesting because the, the province hasn't gone ahead and, and funded these, yet ironically, as often happens with uh, any government agency, is they've sort of prevented us from buying whatever we want. Um, they've tried to narrow it down to two or three because they want some uh, unity within the organization, within the region, some standardization, mm -hmm. which does make sense. But, but as I say, ultimately, if we look into the future, 10, 15, 20 years, I'm going to have one carried with me. Mm -hmm. And I'll have my own, and I'll buy my own, and I'll use my own. 
Um, right. And I think that's the way it's going to go. But in the interim, I think we're going to be using these other measures and, until then. Okay, kind of like my fitness pal on on our phones years oh, ago. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> we yes. had to do a lot of calculating yeah. to figure all that out, and now we have it right on our phone, right in front of us. And you can see that, and I've uh, you've got apps now on the phone that can actually measure your blood pressure, your heart rate, and track a lot of things. So, you know, technology is going to have a tremendous uh, impact on healthcare. Already is, and will continue mm -hmm. to, as we see, and that pace will accelerate. Yeah. So you say they're working on policies now. Yes, and, and who knows when that will happen, but I, I think, as I say, that the technology and the patients will drive it, mm -hmm. meaning the patients are going to be saying, listen, it's available, we want to use it, physicians will buy it on their own and use it, and, and that's what's going to drive change in the future, and uh, I think the government will have to just catch up. Okay, so we won't wait for them, we'll go ahead with that. What timeline do you see for us having one? Good question. I, could, I wish I could give you clear-cut, uh, firm guidelines. Um, our first step is to get the, the doctors educated and then to buy one. So, you know, after we get educated, are we looking six months? Are we looking nine months? I would think that type of time frame. And then that top technology will stay current for only so long. Exactly, and, and we don't know. And again, I thank everybody for their patience because, you know, the, the money's there and everybody would like to go ahead and do something. But we have to do the right thing and we have to do something that's going to work with all the physicians. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, if we've got four physicians, they'd all have to go for individual um, um, training right. for these. How long would that training take? Well, usually they're a two-day course and we're actually trying to arrange attendance of one either here locally, which we'll get here ourselves, or we'll have to go to Portage and travel. And after that, then we have to do a number of scans. And actually, we may be asking some of the nurses so we can scan various tummies and uh, yeah. thyroids and things yeah. uh, as part of our accreditation. So that'll be part of the process. That's right. Just like anybody else has to pass their skills, exactly. you would have to do the same thing. You bet. You would have to do the same thing. So. Um, uh, you're hoping to still be working when that oh God, when yes. that comes around. <laughs> good, good. But it is it, is it in the near future then we can say. Yes, yes. Okay, that's and good. And again, I really want to recognize the tremendous work that the Health Auxiliary has done mm -hmm. in the community, and we really, really appreciate that. All the fundraising and that's what we're here for. We're here to provide good patient care in the country, in the hospital, in your town. Well, that's great. We're really looking forward to it. Um, I retire in a year and a half. Oh, but don't say it. <laughs> I know don't I am. Say it. But I hope that it's around when I'm still working as a casual yes. person so I can see the results of uh, having this machine in our little town of Souris. I'll be glad to see you there. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for coming in, Dr. Thank Crabb, you. and joining it's been a pleasure. us. Spotlight in Souris is brought to you by volunteers of WCG TV. I'd like to thank our cameraman, Gil and Mark, for helping us out today. And I'd like to thank Sheila Kirkup, who is our producer. And thank you to all the volunteers who make WCG Spotlight on Cirrus uh, happen. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great day.